and I'm a wizard. And I'm starting a school for magicians, and I'm going to talk about how we plan to make new kinds of magic. So if I put you in a time machine, and I sent you back to the 17th century, you might not enjoy it very much, but you could probably survive. But if I gave you an iPhone to take with you, with a decent data plan, in the first week, you'd be a god. And in the second week, after your battery runs out, they'd call you a witch, and they'd probably burn you at the stake. So it's fair to say that we're all magicians today, and it's thanks to technology. This is Clark's third law. Any technology that can be distinguished from magic is insufficiently advanced, is the way that I like to think of it. Do you guys remember the Marauder's Map from Harry Potter? There's a short video here. J.K. Rowling first described the Marauder's Map in Harry Potter in The Prisoner of Azkaban. You guys remember reading this when it first came out in 1999? So that same year, a little company set up shop in Palo Alto, a company called Google. And 10 years later, in 2009, Google launched a service called Latitude, and millions of people use it every day. So isn't it wonderful when fiction becomes fact and science fiction and fantasy come true? This also came out in 1999. Remember The Matrix? This is the scene where Neo says, I know Kung Fu. All right? And now that we have the internet, we can actually do this. All right? Now, it's never quite that easy. Sometimes you actually do have to study. But, you know, I'm a magic user. You're a magic user. Everyone here is a magic user in some way. But what kind of magic user are you? Are you a wizard or are you a muggle? Can you only repeat the spells that have been invented by sorcerers, or can you create new spells of your own? The stories are full of boys and girls who don't know that they're magicians until some elder wizard comes along and says, you have already been doing magic, even though you didn't know it was magic. So what is magic? Right? Magic is about the manipulation of reality through the transcendence of natural limitations. In other words, magicians use supernatural powers to change the world. And I believe that deep down, if you talk to any technologist, any scientist, any engineer, what they really want is to live in a world where magic is real. And just look at what we've done in the last couple hundred years of science, right? If you take astral projection to be able to shoot yourself across space and send your image far away and talk to people, well, you know, we can do that. It's called Skype. It's called iChat, right? And now we can fly around the world if we want to. It's called Google Earth. And it's amazing. And this is astral projection. And if you showed this to somebody from 300 years ago, they would say that you were a magician. So telepathy, right? To be able to know what somebody's thinking, well, we can do that. It's called Twitter. <laughs> and what we've learned is that what most people think isn't terribly interesting. So, you know, if you're a magician, you can invoke thousands of demons from another plane of existence and order them to do your bidding. You know, don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you. This is documentation written by Amazon, but it's only supposed to make sense to wizards. You know, when we talk to muggles, we call it cloud computing so that they can pretend to understand it. <clears throat> but this is serious stuff, right? Magicians can pour state secrets into the light of day. Magicians can enable the common people to overthrow dictators, and magicians can take on kings and queens. And on some level, doing this, we're all inspired by Frodo going to Mount Doom to throw the ring into the fire, right? So I'm proud to be a programmer. I'm proud to be a magician. But what else do magicians do with all this power? In 2005, in the US, there was a master magician whose name is Paul Graham, and he started a school for wizards. Hogwarts for geeks. Oops, that's not Paul Graham. This is Paul Graham, ordinary looking guy. He's actually one of the greatest living conjurers in a language called Lisp. Are there any programmers in the room? Does anybody here do Lisp? All right. So back in 1995, he started a company called ViaWeb to do something which at the time nobody else had done. He made it easy for merchants to sell stuff on the internet. This is 1995. And he wrote all the code in Lisp. And three years later, Yahoo gave him $49 million, bought his company, and now it's Yahoo Stores. So what is he doing now? Now he's running a school for programmers who want to follow in his footsteps. 
Do you use Dropbox? Have you heard of Airbnb? So Dropbox was founded by two young programmers who dropped out of MIT and moved to California to apprentice under Paul Graham. And they had a simple idea, which is that everybody could have a folder on their computer, and that folder would be the same across all their computers. And isn't that a simple idea? And it works. It works like magic. So Dropbox did Y Combinator in 2007, and today they make millions of dollars in subscription fees from people like you and me. And today, hundreds of programmers do what they did. They spend three months at what's called a seed accelerator in Silicon Valley. They go to Y Combinator. If you're in Boulder, you can go to Techstars. And now, if you're in Singapore, you can come to JFDI. And my co-founder and I started JFDI with the motto, in Asia for Asia. And that's important because Asia is different, right? People stay at home with their, oh, there's the frog. We had to make up what JFDI actually stands for uh, in a hurry, so we picked the joyful frog. Um, so people stay at home with their parents until they get married, which is uh, probably why they don't get married, right? <laughs> and in Asia, most people get online for the first time using a phone, not a computer, right? So I like to think of Singapore as the technology capital of Southeast Asia. It has the best of East and West. And here in Singapore, we can go across the street to Mario Batali or Wolfgang Puck for lunch, and then for dinner, we can go and have chili crab and stingray. And here in Singapore, we have iPhone apps that don't make sense to anybody else. <laughs> so here in Singapore, right, starting in January next year, we hope to build 15 companies just the way that uh, Y Combinator helped to build Dropbox. You know, and we don't want to do any Groupon clones, because that's boring. We want these companies to be magical in some way. And I want to share with you six examples of the kinds of ideas that these companies might try to bring to life. And the one thing that they all have in common is that they're all inspired in their own way by magic, by the principle that we should make science fiction come true, right? even if it's just by a tiny amount. And this is what they call innovation. But innovation is actually really easy. You can, you can just do it in four steps. And this is probably the most boring slide in the entire presentation. You go out there and you sort of understand the world, which is why scientists and engineers actually make really good entrepreneurs, because they can do this. It might surprise you, but there are a lot of people who cannot build mental models of the world outside their head. And then you find some reason that the world out there is not good enough. And then you think there's got to be a better way. And then you try to bring that better way out of your head back into the world, and that's kind of the challenge. And they call that entrepreneurship. So, first idea. I'm gonna give you six ideas, each idea one minute. The dumpling of love, okay? So imagine you're a teenage girl, and you and your boyfriend go to one of those ridiculous, like, stupid Hello Kitty shops in, like, Far East, okay? And on the shelf, you see a pair of these soft, glowing Xiaolongbao. Well, actually, one of them is glowing, right? The way that Apple products glow when they sleep, and the other one is not. And so you pick up the one that's glowing, and you squeeze it, and the glow dims out, and the other one begins to glow. And you're like, oh my god, this is so cute. Come, honey, let's buy it in a pair. Boyfriend, girlfriend, right? <laughs> and when I'm thinking of you, I can squeeze it. And when you're thinking of me, you can squeeze it. <laughs> and when you don't squeeze it back, there's drama, <laughs> right? So this is going to be a hit. People pay a lot for drama. Can you imagine the games that people will play in school, right? The girls all sit there, and they all take out their dumplings. And they all say, OK, girls, one, two, three, squeeze. Right? And then they wait. <laughs> All right, next idea. So conspicuous consumption is out, right? Austerity is in, we're sort of in a recession, and people don't really want to be that materialistic. So at the same time, though, luxury goods are important because they allow you to sort of show off your status. These are all status symbols. So imagine an app. Right? There are a lot of apps where you can do group buying or you can do like price comparison. You go to the shop and you zap the thing. You're like, all right, I could buy this you know, cheaper in Tampanese. So I'll go to Tampanese. So imagine an app, though, where you go and you're like, this is a really nice handbag. It's a $2,000 handbag. I could buy it. I want to buy it, but I will not buy it because I want to save the world and Louis Vuitton is killing too many cows. Right? But you still want to communicate that you have really good taste. So you use the app to post on your Facebook wall 
to show that you would have bought this, but you didn't, right? So not only do you have good taste, <laughs> you also save the environment, right? So you're like awesome twice. But you have to put your money where your mouth is, so maybe 1% of the fee, you know, 20 bucks, goes into the app, and that's how the app makes money. But that feels like a little wrong, because you know, the app should be a social enterprise, right? So imagine if this 20 bucks actually went somewhere else. This is kind of an abstract idea, but imagine if, all right, so half the money goes to the app and they make a lot of money. But let's say you reserve half the money, so half of 1% is 10 bucks on your handbag, and you sort of dedicate that to a pool of doing good things, right? Sort of some sort of social pool that could go towards the WWF or it could go towards the Red Cross. You know, maybe you don't really care where it goes. You're happy to let other people make that decision. But together, you're sort of collectively purchasing these public goods, if it's donating to a charity. And you could delegate your vote to somebody else, and they could delegate their vote to somebody else, and so you have this like transitive delegation which begins to look like a representative democracy, doesn't it? Because you've got representation, you've got revenue, and you've got the dedication to purchase these public goods. How about that? Maybe it turns into micro-taxation and micro-government. So here's another idea. Um, I have a lot of crap, and the last time I had to move, I was like, oh no, I don't want to put all my crap in a box and then move it and then unbox it, and it's still crap at the new place. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a service where you could send all the crap to someone, somewhere, and if it was documents, they would scan it to a PDF, but if it was a 3D object, and you, know, you have a lot of these sentimental things, like the t-shirt that I used to love when I was 18, or the chess trophy that I won when I was nine, right, or this fish that my grandmother gave me. You, know, you, you, you don't want to throw it away, but you don't really want to keep it. So imagine if you could archive it to the cloud, Right? It would take high-res pictures from 360. And then once it's been archived, they'll eBay it, or they'll store it, or they'll throw it away. Isn't that kind of cool? So here's another abstract idea. You know, today, web browsers are made to help people consume the internet, to read stuff. And we've done a great job with that, HTML, CSS, you know, responsive design. It's all aimed at making the end user putting the end user in control of the browsing experience. But there's nothing quite like the browser for when the end user wants to be a content producer, right? If they want to create content, if they want to blog, if they want to write, every time I type my little blog entries into that tiny text box, I feel a little bit insecure because if the browser crashes, you know, everything that I've typed in has gone away. And I feel like there needs to be some software that helps end users sort of operate as first class entities when it comes to creating content. Because if you look at how big businesses create content, they think about it as, I'm going to create content, I'm going to monetize it through advertising, and end users today don't have a way to monetize their content through advertising. And that's really hard, and what if we could make it easy? So, final idea here is that you know, humans have been inventing new media for a really long time, printing press, telegraph, telephone, but every time we invent a new medium, we use it the same ways. You know, grandparents have always wanted to see pictures of their grandchildren. And whether we do that through a little digital photo frame, or through an iPad, or through just sending them the pictures, that's what people want to do. So here we have someone, this, uh, this is his second wife, this is an old man, who actually met his wife online. So you think that online dating is new? It's actually been going on for a really long time. He met her online. They would type in Morse code to each other because this guy happened to grow up in a very small town. He was quite geeky, and one of the first jobs he had at the age of 16 was being a telegraph operator, which is, you know, if you think about it, back in the old days, if you were a geek, that would be the coolest job in town, right? Now, when you think about what these telegraph operators do, you know, if there's a customer in the shop, they will send, okay, sir, I'll send your message. But when there are no customers in the shop, do you know what these guys do? They're all IMing with each other, right? <laughs> so he actually met his wife that way, and he actually asked her to marry him over Morse code on a telegraph, and she said yes. And this guy is Thomas Edison back in 1886. So the idea that you know, people use media the same way, when I first saw Twitter, I was like, I've seen this before. This is IRC, but with like 1,000% overhead over HTTP. 
we use IRC and we use Twitter in exactly the same way, short status updates. In fact, hashtags, you know, I just think of that as we call it a channel. So these are just a few examples of the kinds of magic that we hope to bring to life. And the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And sometimes a magician just looks like this. If you're an engineer, if you're a scientist, you're a magician. So if these ideas appeal to you, and if you're in a position to spend four months working with us, come talk to me. Thank you.